Good afternoon, church. Uh, I know this is not the way that we like to worship, that we prefer to worship, but it's still worship and we're still together, even if it's virtual. And so we're still going to dig into the word today. Uh, I know this weekend was supposed to be our kickoff. Uh, we were supposed to be reading 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through the end of that chapter. Uh, but this COVID break has actually afforded us an opportunity, imagine that, to dig a little bit more into the beginning of 2 Corinthians 5. You know, what we've been doing this last month has been laying a foundation to prepare for the kickoff, and we get to keep doing that, which is a blessing in disguise, I think is how we put it. And I think you're going to find that what we talk about today is immensely relevant for the situation we find ourselves in right now as a fellowship. So do you guys just want to dig into it, shall we? 2 Corinthians 5 uh, the title of today's lesson is Tents and Houses, Clothes and Thrones. Tents and Houses, Clothes and Thrones. The title game has been unbelievable recently. Uh, let's just dig into it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it reads, and this is the NIV, by the way. It reads, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, we've had this challenging relationship with 2 Corinthians 5 in the NIV for the last few weeks, and when you read this, you think, okay, this just sounds like the worst camping trip ever. There's groaning, people are trying to put on clothes, we're in a tent, we're going to dissect this, and, and I, I think we're going to find some really inspiring stuff from Paul. So, just to recap, Paul is continuing a, a line of thought that he started well, at the beginning of 2 Corinthians, but especially last week. If you remember what we talked about last week, Paul is trying to help the Corinthians elevate their perspective. He's trying to grant them an eternal perspective. And so what does he talk about? He talks about the realities of the life that they're living, and he talks about the even greater reality that is heaven, that is the new covenant relationship that they're, they have with God now. So in the last few chapters, We've talked about an inverted value system, right? I talk about this every week, an inverted value system. The, the Corinthians think they have kingdom on straight, but actually they need to elevate and change and even invert the way that they've been thinking about kingdom. And they need to start practicing cruciform living, living like Christ. One of the key themes that keeps coming up is reconciliation. This idea that we are, we are responsible for the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus has been reconciled to us, has reconciled us back to God, I should say. And so we get to imitate Jesus in reconciling humanity with God. We are the ambassadors, the reconcilers. That's our mission in this world. Like I said before, Paul is granting them perspective through these reality checks. Hey, here's the reality that you live in. Life is challenging. Carrying out the gospel is challenging, but there's a greater reality of the eternal glory of new covenant relationship with God. This is a greater reality than anything you're struggling with right now. And of course, like always, we are gearing up for our kickoff, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. This is a radical lifestyle. The Christian life, the new covenant life is radical and it's all compelled, that's our key word, compelled by Christ's loving sacrifice. So that's how we got here. And what I'd like to do today is break this down like we've been doing and pick out some key truths. There's some stuff in here that is fascinating to me, and I think, I think you're going to find it really inspiring as well. So let's dig back in 
this time in the message version, to 2 Corinthians verse 1. It reads, For instance, therefore, right? We know that when... The, when <laughs> let me try that again. For instance, we know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven. God made, not handmade, and we'll never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can't hardly wait to move, and so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here seem like a stopover in an unfurnished shack. That's pretty good. And we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. Paul is comparing, like he's been comparing, he's comparing the real life that we're living right now to the eternal life that we're going to have in Jesus when we get to heaven. He's, he's comparing this and he goes, listen, I know how hard it is here. And it's, it's even harder because you know what's coming. You know it's going to get even better. And I love that Paul uses the imagery of a tent. You know, this time in his life, Paul is a tent maker. He's a guy who builds tents and sells them. And so, of course, he's going to use the tent imagery uh, to explain how temporary and fragile our bodies are. You know, Paul, of all people, was well acquainted with the hardships of life. He talks in a few other spots about the thorn in his flesh, and we don't exactly know what that means, but we know that he suffered a ton of hardship. He was imprisoned. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was exiled. Like, he had a million things going on. The realities of Paul's life granted him an eternal perspective, a perspective on heaven and on Jesus rather than the problems he was going through. And he's trying to acknowledge that, hey, Corinthians, I get it. You have a lot of issues too. You have a lot of realities that you've been forced to face as well. If you read 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the first letter, the Corinthians are going through it. They're facing divisions in the church. They're facing persecution. They're facing straight up sin. Some really heavy stuff is going on. Ultimately, they're just out of order. They're out of whack, and it can feel that way for us as well. We're going through it. And I feel like I've done so many lessons in the last year and a half about how tough things are right now. It's this recurring theme of like, yeah, things are pretty tough. COVID, political unrest, social unrest, all kinds of things that we've been confronted with as a church and as a family of churches, as a globe in the last few years. But the sooner we can confront the reality that this is just life, the sooner we can get focused on what's really important, which is the life after life, right? Paul, Paul is acknowledging and validating what the Corinthians are going through, and he's trying to get their focus off of that and onto what really matters, the life after life. Now, there is a problem here. When you focus on heaven all the time, it's kind of a double-edged sword. See, it's, it's awesome to think about heaven. It's awesome to think about what eternal relationship with God is going to be like. But the better image you have of what heaven's going to be, the more you realize how not heavenly real life is. Do you know what I mean by that? It's like um, if you're planning a trip to Disney World and you're so excited and all you can think about is the rides and the funnel cake and the pictures you're going to take with Goofy or whatever... And that's all you can think about. Well, the life you're living until you get to Disney World is pretty bland. And really nothing compares to like, oh, I just can't wait to be at Disney World. That's kind of how the Corinthians are experiencing their lives right now. And I think we are guilty of the same thing. We can get so geared up for once things get back to normal, good luck with that, or, oh man, once we just get to heaven, once the church is at this spot, once my life is at this spot, we project, we project. Once it's this way, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be good to go. And it makes the life that we're currently living kind of miserable. It says, like it says here in the, the message version, we cry out in frustration about the life that we currently have. And my hunch, and I think what Paul is trying to get to here, is that the life you're living right now is not meant to be miserable. It's not meant to be this stopover, this waiting room until you get to heaven. The reality is that, hey, yeah, life is challenging, but you have a life to live in the here and now, and you have objectives to complete in the here and now, and things to accomplish for God in the here and now that you can't just ignore because heaven's around the corner. 
It's pretty challenging. It's a really tough way to live. But Paul immediately grants them a solution in verse 5. Check this out. Verse 5. I have the NIV version and the message version. I'll read both. In the NIV it reads, Now the one who is fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And in the modern English it says, The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. This is the key. Life is challenging. Man, I want to go to heaven. Paul even in many places talks about how badly he wants to get to heaven and be with Jesus. But God grants us something to whet our appetite, to hold us over. It's like um, if dinner's at seven, but you're hungry at five, so you have a little snack. This is what Paul is getting at. The spirit is what keeps us going. The Spirit offers us comfort and hope and endurance. We get the Spirit right here, right now, in this challenging life. We get a little piece of heaven, like it says there, to tide us over until we get to the real thing. And this piece of heaven keeps our perspective in balance. Because I have a little bit of heaven in me, nothing that I'm dealing with seems impossible. Because I know heaven's around the corner. Nothing's going to overwhelm me or put me into despair, like it says in 2 Corinthians 4, right? I'll be perplexed. I'll stumble, but I won't fall down. Now, if I have this little piece of heaven, I always have a reminder of how good God is, and how good heaven's going to be, and how amazing Jesus is. Heaven, the spirit in me, keeps me going. And so as a church right now, with COVID swirling, with real life happening to us every single day, now is the time to double down on spirit. I, I, I've done, I can't remember how many lessons I've done where I've brought up spirit and talked about at you know John 14, John 16, there's all these great scriptures about the Holy Spirit. Get in touch with the spirit. God has placed the spirit on your heart, in your heart, if you're a disciple, for a reason because he wants you to keep going, because he wants you to endure this hard life, and he wants to see you in heaven. And so now is the time to double down on spirit, to work on our connection to spirit, to listen to spirit. Now, if I'm saying these things, they sound like foreign concepts, talk to a brother or sister and get some help with this. I didn't understand the Holy Spirit for the first, gosh, five, six years of being a Christian, which seems like a big deal. You get the Holy Spirit at baptism and then you just don't talk to him for six, right? That's crazy. But I was young and I didn't, un, the Spirit just seemed kind of like mystical and weird. And so I just ignored the Holy Spirit. But that is not what Paul prescribes here. He says, God puts the Spirit on your heart as a deposit, as a guarantee of what is to come. Let's move forward. In verse six here, we're back in the NIV because the message version doesn't quite do it justice, to be totally honest. Verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore we are always confident, and we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This passage, this, oh man, I, I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, it just sounded familiar. And I was trying to remember what scripture it was, and I got it, but I want to give you a chance to guess. So five seconds on the clock. Did you get it? It's Philippians. Philippians 1, 21 through 26. I left my Bible over there, so I'm going to have to flip over to it here. Paul says this exact same thing in Philippians chapter 1. Check this out in verse 21. It says, for, me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul talks about this on multiple occasions. 
this idea that life is challenging, but it's good because I get to imitate Jesus. Death is kind of scary, but it's good because I get to be with Jesus. We can't lose. Ah, how great is Paul and how great is Jesus? If I'm alive, I'm imitating Jesus. If I'm dead, I'm with Jesus. So I can't lose. And that's what Paul is trying to remind the Corinthians of. Your hope in heaven shouldn't delude what you're doing right here, right now. Right now, you get to be like Jesus. Right now, you get to get closer to God. Right now, you have the Holy Spirit. And so your life is good. And if and when the time is that you're going to move on and go to heaven, that'll be great too. But heaven is not the barrier, the, the, the devaluer of the present. Let me say that a different way. The present, the life you're living, is not devalued by heaven. Heaven is great, but life is pretty good too. Life has a lot of value and merit to it because right now is when I get to imitate Jesus. Of course heaven's better. Of course it's better to be with Jesus, but faith is what allows us to see past these earthly troubles and continue to live good and valuable lives. Remember, we live by faith, not by sight. There you go. We live by faith, not by sight. And so if Jesus is your focus, if you're living by faith, if Jesus is at the center of your life, it doesn't matter if you're here or there. It doesn't matter if you're in heaven or you're on earth because Jesus is the focus. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about an eternal perspective. That's Jesus at the foreground. That's Jesus right in front of you. And so your surroundings ultimately don't matter that much. You could be a trillionaire. You could be in poverty. You could be sick. You could be healthy. You could live in Washington. You could live in Florida. You could live in Beirut. It doesn't matter. If Jesus is your focus, your surroundings don't matter. And that, my friends, is Paul's perspective. Paul's perspective is that if I'm in prison, Jesus is Lord. If I'm with my brothers, Jesus is Lord. If I'm in the body, my human body, my tent, Jesus is Lord. If I'm, my, if I'm in my earth or my, my heavenly clothing, if I'm clothed with Christ, Jesus is Lord. Is that the way we live? Do we live in such a way that our surroundings ultimately don't matter? I would ask us, what has been challenging for you currently? Because we all have challenges that we're going through. Think about what those challenges are they're hard enough as it is, but how much worse is it because Jesus isn't your focus, right? It's like, I, I rock climb, you guys know this, and I get all kinds of scrapes and scars and stuff all over me. I think Jim saw one the other day. He was like, what happened to you? Rock climbing. And falling and scratching yourself is not fun, but it's made so much worse when you don't put antibacterial ointment on it and you don't put a Band-Aid on it. It makes things 10 times worse. Same thing happens in our earthly lives. Bad things happen. Reality happens. But it's made 10 times worse when we don't focus on Jesus, right? If Jesus is the focus, good things and bad things are gonna happen, but they aren't gonna knock us down because I'm holding on to the cross. That is the difference. That is what Paul and Timothy and Silas have unlocked here and they're trying to share it with the Corinthians. He's trying to grant them an eternal perspective. Get your focus on track and nothing can shake you. So that's the first uh, Jeopardy game here. But there was something else nagging at me when I was reading this. I'm going to read it one more time here. Verses six through eight. It says, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And so I'm reading this passage and I'm thinking, okay, tents, living by faith, not by sight. God has made a promise. What? There's, there's a story here. There's something familiar about all this. I had deja vu here. Can you think of a, an Old Testament character? Lives in tents, faith, not by sight, is living out a promise Did you get it? Is this an Abraham reference? 
is Paul doing Abraham right now? Who's to say? But I, I think Paul is referencing Abraham on, in more than one way here. Abraham lived in tents his, basically his entire life. He's living off of God's promise. He's living by faith and not by sight. And you can just write this down. We don't have time to read it. But Hebrews 11 verses 8 through 16 talks exactly about this. The writer of Hebrews talks about how people who live by faith are waiting for an eternal city. But they're stuck living in tents for the time being. I don't know if you've been camping, living in a tent, not particularly comfortable. So we're living these uncomfortable lives and we don't have a permanent home, but where our eyes are fixed on heaven. Having our eyes fixed on heaven helps us to endure this tent life that we are living in for the time being. So there's a cool Abraham reference in there that's actually a, coming close, that's like a, a secret hint to midweek that we're doing this Thursday. Don't tell anybody. We're gonna talk about Abraham. Can't wait. <laughs> I'm such a Bible nerd. Uh, <laughs> what we learn from Abraham, what we learn from Paul, what we learn from these people who, who live challenging lives is that tent living is normal. Tent living is good and appropriate. It's part of the journey. Abraham, the father of Israel, the patriarch, lived in tents. Moses lived in tents. Basically, all these, these early patriarch dudes lived in tents. They didn't get to live in this eternal city, this promised land that God had promised them. Same thing is going on for us. We move about, we're kind of nomads in this world. We don't have a permanent home on earth. We endure hardship. We endure COVID. We endure relational strife and spiritual challenges. But that's fine because we have an eternal city that we're hoping for. We have a home in heaven that's going to make everything okay. Let's wrap up here in verse 9. It reads, back in the NIV, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. What does Paul say matters the most? pleasing God. Am I living a life that pleases God? Doesn't matter if things are good. Doesn't matter if things are bad. Doesn't matter if things are just kind of eh. Am I living a life that is pleasing to God? What pleases God is not our surroundings. What pleases God is our response to our surroundings, our response to the hardships that hit us. Paul in that Philippians passage, he's talking about how his, his chains, his imprisonment, is a good thing because it's advancing the gospel. That's an eternal perspective. Think about the hardships in your life. If you lose your job, could this advance the gospel? If you get sick, could this advance the gospel? If you have relationship problems in your family or at work or in your neighborhood or your best friends, could this advance the gospel? Paul's constantly asking that question. How is this about Jesus? This shipwreck that hit me, this imprisonment, this trial, this uh, sickness. How is this about Jesus? And I would urge us to ask the exact same question whenever hardship hits our lives. How is this about Jesus? You know, the last thing that Paul talks about here is the judgment seat of Christ. Whoa, right? Immediately terrifying imagery in the English. But unfortunately, it's, it's the best translation we can get but it really doesn't do it justice. The idea of judgment, and we're gonna talk about this in the next few weeks when we get into our first series, but this idea of judgment is not about like judgment, like persecution, like you're wrong and you're gonna get punished. Punishment doesn't really factor in, really. This word judgment, the most literal translation is exposure. And if you have nothing to hide, if you're living a good, moral, Christ-like life, Exposure is a good thing. I would love for the good deeds I've done to be exposed by Jesus. I would love for my true, pure motivation to be exposed by Jesus. If you're living a, a, the life of a disciple, the, a Christian life, exposure shouldn't scare you at all. Judgment shouldn't scare you at all. See, the word that gets used, the, the actual Greek word is bima or 
bema. And you probably heard that word from the podcast, but this word bema literally means like a throne or like a central place. So in a Jewish synagogue, especially back in Jesus's day, there was this place called the bema seat, the, um, the essentially like the seat of the word. And in this big room, there'd be a kind of a, an elevated platform right in the center of the synagogue. And that is where the reader for the day did his thing. It's kind of like our podium in a church service, but it's right in the center of the room. And there's this idea that the word of God takes the absolute center. And so whoever is reading the word of God, whoever is sharing the word, is the one who deserves the seat at the center. And that is the seat that Jesus gets in all of creation. Paul says that Jesus sits at the absolute center of everything. And because Jesus is at the center, he exposes everything around him. Because Jesus is the word, John 1, check it out. Jesus is the word. He has the authority to judge everything. And that, whoo, man, that is a huge idea. And there's a ton of places we can go with it, but we got to wrap up. So that is the enduring image I want us to walk away with as we move into communion. Jesus at the absolute center. Because Jesus is Lord, because Jesus is the center of my life, I'm not afraid for Jesus to expose my life. I hope you can say the same because Jesus is my prime motive, because Jesus sits on the throne, because Jesus is in the Bema seat, the judgment seat, the exposure seat. I'm not afraid of anything. I can manage through and endure through the challenges of this life. I can keep my hope in heaven because Jesus is at the center. I would ask us, as we move into communion, what does Jesus's life and his death expose about you? Remember, if you're living a Christian life, you have nothing to fear in exposure. You have nothing to fear in judgment. When Paul talks about the, the things that are due to us for what's done while in the body, good or bad, that shouldn't be scary at all. But it is scary if Jesus isn't the center of our lives. The truth is, in heaven, Jesus is going to be right at the center where he belongs. And so the way we must live right now, the perspective we must have right now is that Jesus is the center of my life. I pray and I hope that we can say this in every situation we find ourselves in, good or bad, tents or houses, clothed or unclothed, worshiping or groaning, whatever it is, I pray, I pray that Jesus can be at the absolute center of every aspect of our lives. I'm gonna go ahead and pray for our communion, the, the bread that represents Jesus's body that was broken for us and the blood that represents his life that he lived as an example to us. I'm gonna pray and then I, I wanna encourage us to take communion and take a little bit of time to meditate on the cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your son's life, for your son's death, which gives us the opportunity to be with you God, I pray that in everything we do, good or bad, uh, God, what, no matter what comes our way, that Jesus can be at the center. God, give us an eternal perspective, a perspective of life and death that puts Jesus where he belongs. God, we know that we're living in tents right now, intense lives and in earthly, temporary tents. God, but the, the eternal life you want to give us is greater than, realer than anything we're experiencing in this life. God, give us an eternal perspective to imitate Jesus, to make him the center of everything we do. God, thank you for his sacrifice for us. God, we love you. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.